this to you this morning. James chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses. Whoa, come on. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more, what's the word? Grace. Grace. Oh, folks, we are in for a doozy this morning. <laughs> Let me pray for us. Father, that you would have us in this portion of the epistle of James on this Sunday is no coincidence. This is exactly where you want us. And Lord, I know it's exactly where I need to be. And Lord, if this passage is for no one else, it's for me today. Stern warning. And yet, it reminds us of how intimate our relationship with you is. So intimate, so close, that we can actually become adulterers and adulteresses. So Lord Jesus, this morning, would you capture our thoughts? Would you let the world just fade away? And would you speak into each of our hearts here today? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the beginning of the study, I told you that James is trying to move each and every one of us towards maturity in Christ. And he is not going to pull any punches in his attempt to do that. In fact, it's just the opposite. James is out to rattle our cage. He is writing to wake us up. He is exhorting us so that we as Christians are starting to live up to all that is ours in Christ. And this passage is the epitome of that. You probably noticed I did not say at the beginning of this section, this is one of the greatest sections of the Bible you'll ever study, which I say just about every week. Quite the opposite. This may be one of the hardest sections of the Bible you've ever studied. Because of that, it would be really easy for me to use this to condemn you or to bring great conviction on you. If there was ever a section of the Bible a pastor could use to beat the sheep, well, this, this would be it. it. It's been said if you really want to bring conviction on a congregation, just talk about the topic of prayer. It's like Rob said last week, if you ever want to reduce the church down to an acceptable level, just call a prayer meeting. And so pastors will use that topic for that purpose. But what we have before us this morning is even a greater opportunity for a pastor to do that. That's why I want to take this section on from a little different angle today. Instead of expositing it and then telling you how this applies to you, I want to exposit this passage and tell you how it applies to me. If there's ever been anyone that needs a passage like this, folks, it's yours truly. And so here we go. James says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. The first thing we have to figure out here is who is James calling adulterers and adulteresses? Is this addressed to the non-believer who has turned their back on God? Is this addressed to the pagan world who has gone after foreign gods? Is this addressed to the Jews that we know James was writing to, who have forsaken their relationship with Jehovah and gone after materialism, the things of the world? The answer to all these questions is no, although some commentators would have us think differently. Now, this whole section is addressed to the church. It's addressed to believers, which means this whole section is addressed to me. There are things I can do as a believer that will make me an adulterer, an adulteress in God's eyes. Now, what's meant by the term adulterer and adulteress? Why does James use this radical term? Well, 
if you're a student of the Bible, you know this is an Old Testament term that God used in regards to the nation of Israel when Israel would go after other gods, when Israel would set up altars to Baal or Ishtar or Molech. God would call them harlots, adulterous, because they'd forsaken that love relationship with Him and given their affection and their worship to others. That broke the heart of God because it was a breach of trust. It was the breach of intimacy that God wanted to have with His people. See, what this term does is it puts our relationship with God in the most intimate of terms. God told Israel, I will be a husband to you. And he was. But like a husband can cheat on her wife and a, and a wife can cheat on her husband. They could cheat on God. And when they did, God took it personal. It was spiritual adultery. It was spiritual harlotry. And for us as Christians, we know that we have that same relationship with our God. Jesus calls us his bride. Jesus is anticipating that day when the church, his bride, that great gathering of believers throughout the ages will be presented to him as a chaste virgin to be his wife. We are his bride. He is our bridegroom. I am his bride. He is my bridegroom. And so it's possible for me to commit spiritual adultery against my God. It's possible for me to breach that intimacy, to breach that trust that I have with God. Now, Israel did this by going after other gods. How can I do this? Well, James tells me this in verse 4. He says, do you not know, Ricky, that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be the friend of God makes himself an enemy, a friend of the world, makes himself an enemy of God. See, what breaks fellowship and the intimacy that I have with God is a friendship with what James calls the world. Now, what does James mean by this term, the world? Well, think of it this way. The world is man's way of doing things as opposed to God's way of doing things. Things. The world is man's priorities as opposed to God's priorities. The world is what man thinks is important as opposed to what God thinks is important. And one of the things I love about the Bible is that it's just so simple. It basically says there's a way that man would do things, there's a way that God would do things. And as believers, we should be striving after, striving towards what God would have us to do. And, and that makes sense, doesn't it? But here's the problem with that. The world's ways, man's ways, is the natural way. And God's way is the supernatural way. Rob McQuay talked about that last week as well, didn't he? The world's way, man's way, is very appealing to my natural desires. And God's ways will oftentimes go against my natural desires. In fact, sometimes they radically go against my natural desires. Now, let me give you a couple examples of how this works its way out in my life. Let me tell you how I can get sucked into being a friend of the world. First, the world will tell me to look out for myself, that I have to take care of number one. I have to learn how to love myself before I can love others. The world's view is that my life should revolve around me. Now, I hear that and I say, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> take care of yourself. Love yourself. Watch out for number one. But you see, the Bible tells me that I need to first love God. Then I need to love the people around me, even my enemies. And then lastly, I take care of myself. My priority should be Jesus and then others. Then lastly, myself. God tells me if I want to be great in this kingdom, I need to be the servant of all. I need to be the least of all. And even though I know this is right, even though I know the good things that happen when I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, this doesn't come natural to me. This doesn't sit well with my flesh. And I have to admit, there are times when I get sucked into this. The world sways me into its thinking, and I get all self-centered, and I get all caught up in myself, and I think everything should revolve around me. And if it doesn't revolve around me, I get uptight. I get grumbly. I know it's hard to imagine. 
I get uptight. I get mad. But what's worse than all that? In that process, I'm siding with the world. And I've become the enemy of God. I cut myself off from his blessings, his presence in my life. Here's another example. The, word, the, the world will tell me that there are things that are fine and fun and desirable that I should be participating in that God calls sin that I need to stay away from. Now, I know no one likes the word sin today. There are some churches that have banned the word sin from being used in the pulpit. And certainly our culture today would deem it as being intolerant or fanatical if we labeled some activities or some behaviors as sin. But folks, here's what I found out. There are things out there in the world that are flat out sin that I need to stay away from. But again, here's the problem. Not only would the world disagree with me about that, but they would take those very things, they would dress them up, they would glamorize them, and they would dangle them before me relentlessly. If you doubt that, then just think about any modern TV sitcom and look at what they're offering now for Family Fair. Took a, take a look at what the periodicals are shouting at you as you go through the line in the grocery store. Listen to what they're promoting in the lyrics of popular music. Look at the themes in many of the theaters today and the movies that are being shown there. Now, you would think as a pastor, I'd be immune from those things. That those things wouldn't bother me a bit. That I could look sin in the face and it would back down and it would flee from me. Folks, that's just not the case. There is sin out there that is so tempting to me. There is sin out there that is so alluring to me. I'm drawn to it like a bear to honey. And you see, when I go after those things, when I begin to dabble in that sin, when I try that sin on for size to see how it looks and how it feels on me, I am making myself an enemy of God and a friend of the world. I'm committing spiritual adultery. But let me give you one more that I really wrestle with. The world tries to convince me that things are more important than people. And if I have the right things and can do the cool things that those things want me to do, I'm going to be happy and fulfilled and satisfied. So I have to get those things at any cost. And I have to do all that cool stuff at any cost. And if people get in the way, well, that's too bad. They just have to go. Now, I know that sounds totally selfish, and it is. But you see, I can so easily justify that by saying, well, if I'm happy, I can make others happy. And of course, I share my stuff. A little bit. <laughs> but you see, God tells me it's not the abundance of stuff that's going to make me happy. It's not the one who dies with the most toys that's going to win. It's people. And the special relationships I can have with people that will make me happy and fulfilled. Listen, I've sat by enough deathbeds to know it's not what people own that makes them happy and fulfilled at the end of their lives. I, I've never sat with a dying man who said, I, I wished I drove a fancier car. I wish I bought a bigger house. I wish I made more money. I want to die with my iPhone 5 in my hand. <laughs> now, what, what I've heard people say is that they wish they spent more time with their kids. They wish they spent more time with their spouse. They wish they spent more time doing significant things with the people that they love and that they care about. I've sat with people who've had it all in abundance, and at the end of their lives, all they're left with is a bunch of stuff that's going to burn. All they're left with is a bunch of stuff that in the end didn't satisfy and in fact distracted them from the very things that would have made them happy. Folks, God is right. People in our relationship with people are way more important than things. Way more. Well, I could give you 50 more. 
examples of how I commit spiritual adultery against my God. But I think you're getting the drift of what this looks like, at least what it looks like for me. You know, at this point in the study, some of you might be thinking, man, the God of the Bible, he must be some kind of meanie. The God of the Bible, he must be really insecure. The God of the Bible, he must be some cosmic killjoy. Folks, it's not that at all. In fact, it's just the opposite. Look with me at verse 5. Or do you think the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously? Oh, folks, what you have here is one of the clear themes of Scripture from beginning to end. God is jealous for those who are His. Not jealous in some kind of bad sense of the word, but jealous in that He wants the very best for us. Jealous in that he wants to keep us from that which will harm us. And this is something I love about our God. He's not willing just to let us drift off. Get all tangled up in those things that will destroy us. Wipe us out. No, he will correct us. He will instruct us. He will bust us if necessary. He will change the course of our life to keep us from those things. And if you're a parent here this morning, oh, you you really understand this. You understand this. You have a jealousy for your children that is off the charts, and rightly so. You want them to succeed. You want them to excel in their lives. You want them to be happy and blessed, and you're jealous for that, and for good reason. And what you really don't want is for them to get caught up in that stuff that will detour them, or wipe them out, or destroy them, or hold them back from all that God has for them. And so you instruct them. You correct them. You try to bring guidance into their lives. Not because you don't want them to have fun. Not because you don't want them to experience life. No, just the opposite. You don't want them to miss out on life and all that God has for them. God's the same way with us. Our God is jealous for us. In fact, he told Moses in Exodus 34 that his name is is jealous in regards to his people. I mean, think of that. Of all the names God has given us to describe his nature and his character, this is one of them. God says, I am jealous because of you. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians eleven two 2 had that same heart for the church at Corinth. Do you remember that? He said, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Here's a group of people that Paul loved. Here's a group of people that, for the most part, he had won to the Lord. And he wanted the best for them. He really wanted them and to keep them from the stuff that was destroying them and their church. And so Paul wrote them a couple of pretty gnarly letters, which contained a lot of rebuke and instruction and warnings. But you see, it was his jealousy that moved him, that motivated him to do that. He wanted the church to prosper and thrive, not to implode. And see, God doesn't want me messing around with the world because he knows that when I get self-centered, when I buy into that lie that everything has to revolve around me, it's not healthy for me. It's not good for me. God doesn't want me dabbling in sin because he knows that sin kills, sin destroys Sin will keep me from his presence and purpose and plan that he has for my life. God wants me to put people over things because he knows that things will never deliver what they promise. And if I'm all caught up in that, he knows I'm going to be horribly disappointed. See, because God wants the best for me, because God loves me, he will do all that he can to keep me from those things. So these verses... Make me ask myself, am I getting too friendly with the world? Have have I bought into the way the world thinks? Have I bought into the world's standards of what's right and what is wrong? Have I bought into the world's priorities and their values? I I want to examine that in my life. And if so, if so, I'm committing spiritual adultery against my God. I've put myself in that place where I'm being unfaithful to my Lord and Savior. I've made myself his enemy. See, this is God's assessment, and I have to agree with it. I have to see it this way. 
So if that's so, then what do I need to do? Well, I have to repent. Another word that people don't like anymore. They associate it with fundamental, wacko religion. But folks, I got to tell you, I think this is a great word with great promise. To repent means that you realize you're going the wrong direction and that you're going to turn away from that and you're going to get back on that path that takes you the right way. Do you see the potential of that? Do you see it? See, I don't, I don't have to stay in sin. I don't have to carry on with my friendship with the world. I'm not a slave to the things that are wiping me out. No, I can change. I can go in a different direction. And folks, this is possible because God has invited me into this process. I can repent and change because God offers me mercy and forgiveness and grace. I can repent and change because Jesus had provided this for me on the cross and through the resurrection from the dead. In other words, repentance isn't man's idea. It's God's idea. And folks, it's a good idea. And so I repent. I change the direction that I'm going. I move away from the world's way of doing things, and I start doing things God's ways. And again, it's so important that you don't just turn away, but that you turn all the way back to. I've often told you, it's not so much what you don't do in the Christian life as it is what you do that makes a difference. So I have to get back to loving God and esteeming others as being more important than myself. I get back to practicing that which is righteous and loving what is righteous. I get back to using things to bless and to encourage people. You see, I have to do a complete 180, a complete turnaround. I have to get back with being a friend of God. Because you see, folks, that's the place of blessing. That's the place where I am stoked. That's the place where I find the fulfillment and the joy. Now, That doesn't mean it's an easy place to be. As I told you earlier, it's a battle. Folks, I know the world is so alluring. It has such a pull on us. It's like a magnet to me sometimes. It's a battle to stay out of there. But it's a battle worth fighting because that's the place of blessing. Now, let me close with one final thought here this morning. The thing that makes us all possible, and it's one thing. I want to show it to you this morning, but next week we're going to flesh it out. Okay, here it is, the first part of verse 6. But he gives more, what's the word? Grace. Grace. Oh, folks, this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. (laughs) If you're ever thinking about a verse to memorize, this would be a good place to start. But God gives more grace. Remember, grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. This whole process is initiated by the grace of God. And its design is to move you back to that place where you're receiving the full richness of God in your life. See, in this whole process I've talked about this morning, there's no condemnation. There's no sense that you have to work your way back into the good standing of God. No. It's all of grace. And notice, not just a little bit of grace, not just enough to cover you, but God gives, what's the word? More grace. It's grace in abundance. Grace overflowing. Now next week, we're going to focus in on the grace of God. You don't want to miss it. If you're thinking of flying home, no, stay a week. (laughs) Call United. Pastor said... Got to hear about grace. Greatest message in the Bible. So, Father, thank you for your word today. And, Lord, thank you for what it did in my life this week. Thank you for not just the attitude adjustment, but, Lord, the life adjustment that it brings. And, Lord, I, 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 I wish it wasn't true. I wish... The world didn't have the appeal that it does to me. 
Lord, I, I really wish there weren't sinful things out there that didn't appeal to me so strongly. But Lord, that's not the case. And so you warn me. And Lord, when I do go after those things, you tell me exactly what it is and you don't pull any punches. It's adultery. If I cozy up with the world, I, I'm making myself your enemy. God, I, I don't want to do that, Lord. I don't. And Lord, I ask you to forgive me for all the times I do. And thank you, Lord, for that great word, repentance. Thank you, Lord. That I don't have to stay on that road. I don't have to stay there. I don't have to stay a slave to sin. Don't have to stay bound up in the world's thinking, the world's attitudes, the world's standards. I don't have to stay there. I can come out from that. I can come back to your way of doing things, your standards, your priorities, your life. And Father, I know that there's some here this morning that may need to do that right here today. That as they've heard this message, they realize, wow, Pastor, I'm just like you. I get, I get caught up in the world. I, I, I get sucked into thinking like the world thinks and to loving what the world loves and enjoying what the world enjoys. And wow, I see it for what it is today. It's spiritual adultery. It makes me an enemy of God. And Lord, if that's so, that's the work of your spirit in our lives. Our flesh won't tell us that. The world won't tell us that. Lord Jesus, only you will tell us that by your spirit, but it's true. And today you call all men to repent. That's right. But Lord, specifically, you call the church to repent first. And Lord, how can we expect the world to change if we don't change? And how do we expect the world to come to you if we won't come out of the world? And so, Lord Jesus, today as your church, as your people, we, we want to come out of the world. We want to divorce ourselves from the thinking of the world. But Lord, we need your strength. We need your courage. We need the power of your spirit to do that. And it starts right here, right now, Lord. It starts with that commitment to say, Lord, I realize that I see it. And Lord, I agree with you. I agree with your word today. And I've been caught up in this. And Jesus, I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And to break its hold, to break its power over my life. And Lord, that's my prayer for myself today. Lord, I, I want to become less enamored with the world, less in love with the world. But I tell you, I, that's not in me. That's got to be a work of your spirit in me, in my heart. And I have some of my friends here this morning, Lord, they want the same thing, so do that for them. But Lord, it's not just turning away from us what we turn to, and this morning we turn to you. We turn to you, Jesus. Lord, I want to think like you think. I I want your priorities. I want your values. I want your sense of what's right and wrong. I want your morality. I want the priorities of the kingdom alive in me because that's where there's life. That's where there's power. That's where there's kingdom authority for what you call us to do in the world today. And So God, grant that to us today. And Lord, I'll thank you for that. Praise you for that, Lord. And Lord, now we, we, we think about Jennifer and Owen. We think about Wow, these two that we love so much saying, Lord, we want to give ourselves to each other as we give ourselves to you. And Father, we pray a blessing on that today as well. But Lord, before we get to that, there's a little business we have to do right here. And that's with what you spoke to us today. And so God, give us the courage to respond to what your word has spoken. And I will thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand together today. We're going to take just a couple of minutes and we're going to pray.